So uh, welcome, everyone, to this, the uh, 21st uh, David Tillinghast Lecture at the uh, International Tax Program here at the law school. Uh, I know most of you, or at least many of you, I'm David Rosenblum. I'm the director of the International Tax Program, and this is our, uh, our sort of kickoff to the academic year. And uh, we are especially happy this year to have as our speaker Bob Stack, who is an old friend of mine and whom I've known in Washington tax circles for quite a few years. Uh, Bob uh, had a considerable uh, history in private practice uh, with several firms before uh, joining the uh, second term of the Obama administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Tax Affairs. Uh, and in that capacity, I, I think it's fair to say, although we'll probably hear more about this in a couple of minutes, that he was the leading, certainly the leading U.S. representative and maybe one of the very few people following the, uh, the BEPS debate in the OECD for, for quite a few years, and I think we're going to hear, we're going to hear more about that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, what we will do, Bob will give us a lecture on the multilateral instrument, uh, uh, which I'm very eager to hear about since I find it totally confusing. And, uh, and then after that, we'll have a, if we have some time left over, we'll have a few questions, not many, but a couple anyway, and uh, then there will be a brief uh, reception in the back afterwards for everybody. So thank you very much for coming here and in braving the weather. I know that we got an incipient hurricane on our hands, uh, but I'm going to turn the floor over to Bob, and um, welcome. And Thank you so much. It's, um, it's quite an honor um, and a privilege uh, to be here tonight to, to give the Tillinghast Lecture. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to begin by uh, just opening up with a remark about uh, one of my Treasury colleagues who passed away this summer by a fellow by the name of Harry Grubert. Harry was, uh, Harry was I think, in his early 80s, um, and he was one of these economists that worked at the Treasury Department uh, for a really, really long time. I see people here in the audience who had been at Treasury a while back, and, and I'm sure they worked with Harry. The reason I think it's important for folks like me who come in and out of government as career, or I, I should say as political appointees, uh, to call attention to the dedication and smarts and contributions of people like Harry Grubert is it's very important that in the larger community we recognize the contributions that these people take. It's particularly prescient now as you read the tax news every day about tax reform. And what's it all about? It's about what's this tax going to raise? How much is that benefit going to cost? Where are we going to get the money from? And folks like Harry were, were specialists at that. And Harry, in particular, knew so much about international tax and kind of the the mechanics of how the incomes flow, where the royalties are, all the underlying data that helps policymakers do what we do. A wonderful soul. I don't know that he was known that much outside, but I, I would have been remiss if I didn't start tonight by uh, tipping a hat to Harry Grubert, who passed away this summer, a, a wonderful Treasury colleague. <clears throat> now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk, and, and I'm, I'm so, there's a lot of really smart people in the room, people that I, um, people that have taught me a lot over the years, very prestigious group, and I just, I'm going to say at the get-go, uh, my, my email address is bstack at deloitte.com, and so I, I welcome thoughts. I'll, I'll probably publish this at some point, uh, if I'm fortunate enough, and um, if, if, if I say anything stupid or you want to push back, um, you know, the dialogue is part of what makes this type of a, of a, of a venue so fun and interesting, and a way that we all kind of learn and grow in our lives. So I, I certainly, I certainly welcome, uh, welcome that. So I'm here tonight to talk about the multilateral instrument. And one of my biggest intellectual challenges in the next hour is going to be to keep myself on time so I don't become the guy that said he'd give a 55-minute talk and drones on for an hour and 40 minutes. But I will say, as I dug into the topic, um, it started to kind of uh, almost uh, like peeling an onion. You kept finding other issues and, and things to talk about. And as I met with David's students before the class, uh, there's a lot of papers that perhaps can come out of this uh, introduction to the topic. And the question I put forward asking myself was, is the MLI, a, the multilateral instrument, a step forward? 
And let me just de describe what it was. At a signing ceremony in Paris on June 7, 2017, 67 countries signed what's called the Multilateral Convention to Implement Tax Treaty-Related Measures to Prevent Base Erosion and Profit Shifting. From here on in, I'll call it the MLI. Another nine countries expressed their intention to become signatories. So as of today, 71 countries have signed this MLI. Over 2,350 treaties have been listed as covered tax agreements. I'll talk about the process a little bit, but that's how these tax agreements are now kind of under the umbrella of the MLI that I'll describe. The MLI is the culmination of the treaty-related uh, aspects of the G20 OECD's BEPS work, um, which saw the first glimmer of light in the G20 Leaders Declaration in Los Cabos, Mexico in June 2012. I began my career at Treasury as the Deputy Assistant Tre Secretary for International Tax Affairs in March of 13, and in September of 2013, uh, the action plan came out that said over the next two years we're going to work on these 15 items and then in the fall of 2015 the G20 ministers approved 15 action items that covered various sorts of, of BEPS issues. The BEPS project was aimed at minimizing techniques that multinationals can use to shift income to lower no tax jurisdictions and at the same time it sought to improve conflict resolution by uh, improving the MAP process and perhaps pushing arbitration forward, and also sought to harmonize various uh, reporting and, and compliance regimes that companies have to, would have to comply with, like country-by-country country reporting or the uh, transfer pricing reporting that goes on. The BEPS Action Plan and related reports, as I mentioned, consisted of 15 items. But what's really important is that we all understand that of the 15 items, only four of them were minimum standards that countries, in effect, had committed to do. And the rest were things that countries might want to do if they were interested in limiting base erosion and profit shifting out of their jurisdiction or whatnot. The four minimum standards that everybody had to do were first, everybody had committed to put in place a regime for country by country reporting to tax authorities of the information about a company's uh, income, assets, et cetera, taxes in various countries around the world. The second was there was agreement in the OECD on certain rules around what constitutes harmful tax practices and what types of practices uh, would be subject to review by the OECD and declared harmful or not. And here the, the big example was the, the UK patent box, which was declared to be harmful. Um, that came out of this action that said everybody's now going to play by the rules of the harmful tax. Related to that, that action five, countries agreed to exchange rulings with each other if the rulings affected the other jurisdiction's tax. So, so no more might you be able to get a ruling that said you could get taxed here in this country this way and everybody would know it would have affected the other country, but the other country might not know about it. Now those rulings would be exchanged. The third commitment everyone made was to do something to improve the mutual agreement procedure process that's embedded in treaties, called the MAP process. Um, and then finally, um, countries agreed to, to adopt treaty abuse provisions into their, into their treaties or into their domestic law. So those are the four things countries had to do. Now two of those, the MAP changes and the treaty abuse changes, needed to be done in treaties by definition. And so the problem the OECD faced was um, if, if we now finish BEPS, and there are somewhere between two and 3,000 multilateral, uh, uh, bilateral treaties, tax treaties in the world, if we now finish BEPS and everybody goes out and has to start renegotiating bilateral treaties, this was going to be a process that was going to take a ridiculous amount of time. And so from the beginning, the OECD and the folks that started up BEPS had this idea of a multilateral instrument that everybody could sign to, in effect, adopt the, the required provisions out of BEPS. And as we'll see, they used it as an opportunity to also give countries opportunities to take on some of the, let's call them treaty policy improvements that the OECD had been cooking up uh, for many years. So the way it worked is that a country wishing to sign the MLI would typically agree to the provisions relating to MAP. They had to do that, that I'll talk about a little bit later. They had to put a certain amount of language in their preamble, 
about the purpose of taxes, and they had to um, agree to one of the treaty abuse articles that I'll describe. As to the rest, countries were kind of given a menu of provisions I'll talk about, and they could decide, I'll take these, but not those. I'll take permanent establishment, but I'll leave behind fiscally transparent entities. And then when they were done, they were able to um, have a pre-approved pre set of, of provisions they were going to accept, and then they would decide which countries they're willing to call covered tax agreements. So they got, here's the provisions, here's the countries. Other countries would do the same thing. And only when the two countries had chosen each other, we talked about a little bit like speed dating, so France said Spain could be a covered tax agreement, Spain said France, and only then is that bilateral treaty amended, but only with respect to the provisions that each had said they were going to be incorporated in the bilateral treaty. And I know that sounds complicated, but there's a website the OECD put together um, that kind of shows you, you can put the two countries and you can see various ways that these two, um, two, two countries will match up. Now, once the MLI has been ratified by five signatories, it will enter into force on the first day of the fourth month after the fifth instrument. And then there's separate effective date rules that I won't go into for, as is typical with treaties, for when withholding taxes uh, are, are brought into effect under the treaty and other types of income. So we're a ways away, even though it's been signed by countries, countries still have to ratify it in, under their internal procedures and then deposit the instrument when they're done. So we're a ways away before it will become, a, become effective. <laughs> Uh, on the taxes of the different countries. The MLI is a unique international instrument, and I told the students before that there are, treaty, there are papers to be written now that we have an MLI. And one noticeable difference between the MLI and, in, and existing treaties is the function that it performs. Unlike amending a protocol to a treaty or negotiating a new treaty where you've replaced the entire text of the treaty, with this new negotiated protocol or amended treaty or new treaty, the MLI kind of hovers over your pre-existing bilateral treaties with a bunch of provisions that say, yeah, you know our bilateral treaty with X because they're on my list, we are now gonna be importing into it these concepts uh, that, are, that I have signed up for in the MLI. Now, as pointed out by a recent paper by Natalie Bravo of Vienna University, up until now, multilateral experiences in international tax law have been limited to just a few cases. For example, there's an agreement to avoid double taxation between the member countries of the Andean community of nations. There have been some discussions of multilateral instruments, let's say among EU member states, uh, on, on double tax. But in both of those cases, those are instruments that would replace the pre-existing bilateral community, uh, uh, conventions Whereas, as I mentioned, the MLI takes on this very, very different, different role. The other thing I think is really important, based on my experience, to, to mention in a talk like tonight is that the MLI joins other advances in international tax cooperation. Um, I do think we have moved into a new era, and I just thought it's worth mentioning a few of those things that I think a generation ago would have surprised folks that the global community was able to come together about. The first, of course, is the common reporting standard, or the, what we can think of as the internationalization of FATCA, where the United States passed FATCA, and we went around the world and countries said, wow, that's so cool, we're gonna have to find out who the Americans are in our financial institutions and tell the US IRS, we would love to have that information on each other as well. And thus began a push through the G20 for the global acceptance of something called the common reporting standard. Another group that, that, that impressed me while I was in government was a, a group called the Global Forum for Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes. This group monitors countries' abilities to exchange information, meet their obligations under their treaties, to exchange information on request with other countries uh, who, who are in need of information to enforce their tax laws. And the scope of the Global Forum has been expanded to include monitoring uh, information exchange, automatic information exchange, such as we'll see in the common reporting standard in fact, I think what's, what's really important in, in the way the common reporting, I'm sorry, in the way the global forum operates is the fact that countries are more and more agreeing 
to be kind of a, to agreeing A, to adopt standards, and then B, to be peer-reviewed to see if, in fact, they've lived up to their obligations. And there are various ways in the international space that we're observing that, and we'll come back to that in MAP uh, discussion a little later. Now, uh, and I should also mention the Multilateral Convention on Mutual administ Administrative Assistance. This is like a global tax information exchange agreement that was amended. It's still pending before the, tr the Senate. But again, it's an example where countries came together in one, ex one agreement to set the parameters for the general information exchange rules, in effect, updating them for the more recent work uh, uh, at the OECD. So these are important advances. I think we'll see more of it, and it's important for us to understand this context of increased international cooperation. Now, the MLI is going to pose unique issues of interpretation. And then again, for the students in the room, there's lots of interesting writing to be done about these things. Um, I could have done the lecture on these topics, but I would have never emerged, and there would have been nothing else to talk about. But, but let me just make a few, just throw them out there. Among them that people have talked about is, well, you know, the MLI is in French and English, and everybody's treaties are in their official languages, and there's all sorts of rules about which languages cover what, and, you know, we're all going to have at that and to see what changes that, that causes. Some countries might produce a composite text and say, well, you know, we did the MLI, but instead of making you look back and forth to two documents, here's how we're going to think of our treaty as now modified with country X. And of course, that will raise questions about which is the official translation and which one really matters. The MLI contains something called compatibility clauses. What do I do when the provision in the MLI talks about PE rules, but I've got a PE rule in my treaty? How do I make the two compatible? And there's, there are provisions that do that. I heard someone earlier refer to the MLI as complicated. I think it is. But um, th those clauses are supposed to help folks uh, sort that out. And now, too, by the way, we have unique preamble language in the MLI, and everybody's treaty has a preamble. And under the Vienna Convention, you're supposed to use the preamble to tell you what the context and, and object of the treaty was. And you know that will raise issues of kind of which preamble um, uh, suff uh, governs. Now, I want to say tonight, because the title was, you know, is the MLI a step forward? I, I understand those issues are there. I've read some about them. Uh, I, think, I don't think it was a reason not to do the MLI. I think as somebody trained in the common law as I was, uh, I think the law evolves and changes with new and different instruments, and somehow you know, the world doesn't end and we'll get someplace, but there'll be a fair amount of ink spilled and litigation, I think, in certain cases as those rules are being applied. Um, now, as we'll discuss, most of the news about the MLI relates to the provisions around permanent establishment, treaty abuse, and the MAP procedures. But it contains other provisions that countries could choose or not, to, or not to include in their treaties that are generally viewed as helpful advances for tax policy. And if you're keeping score, I put these on the side of, sure, these are a step in the right direction. And I'm going to just go very fast so you have a sense of what's in the document. So Article 3 has rules on how do you treat transparent entities for purposes of getting a benefit of a treaty. And it adopts the US rule that says, well, you wait to see if the other treaty resident is treated in that jurisdiction of deriving the income before you uh, give the treaty benefits from the other contracting state. Article 8 of the MLI has a minimum holding period uh, requirement for dividends. Article 9 has a provision that permits you to tax, it's kind of like our FERPTA, you know, the sale of shares of entities that hold uh, real property. Article 10 has a tri what we call the triangular provision. That applies when you're treaty, you're, you have a treaty partner, but the taxpayer is conducting activities in a branch of the treaty partner where they may not be paying much tax, and how should the treaty apply in that circumstance? Um, I'm not going to delve in tonight to the, to the PE standard. Um, uh, I'm, I'm skipping a couple. I apologize. Um, article, similarly helpful, Article 4 with respect to dual resident entities. Article 5 methods for the elimination of double taxation, that's exemption or credits. And Article 11 gives a savings clause for residence countries akin to what the US has for its citizens. I'm not going to go into the PE changes tonight, although I think they're subject to similar criticisms I'll have of the PPT in terms of a certain uh, lack of clarity. But I will note that there are three changes in the PE clause. One is to the dependent agent rules uh, around concluding contracts. One relates to what are, do all the activity exemptions have to be preparatory and auxiliary? And the third one relates to splitting up contracts in order to avoid PE. 
The one surprise to me was that the new dependent agent rule that kind of makes it easier to view somebody as concluding contracts was not picked up by as many countries as one might have expected. In fact, I will say I, was, I spoke fairly vociferously against the PE provisions as they moved through the OECD to not much effect. Um, but I will note that as it turned out in Europe at least, only three jurisdictions, major countries, uh, adopted the new dependent agent rule, which was France, the Netherlands, and Spain. Um, and so th that we're watching how PE rules evolve will be kind of interesting to see as to which countries adopted the new rule and which didn't. Action 14 aimed to strengthen the effectiveness of MAP, and it did it by, um, because everybody thought there was going to be more disputes after BEPS, so countries agreed companies should have, and taxpayers should have access to an effective and efficient means to address double taxation issues arising under treaties. And so the result of this work was a minimum standard to be included on tax treaties about MAP, more or less mirroring what's in the US treaty, a description of best practices to administer MAP, and agreement of a, to a robust monitoring process to ensure that countries were leading up to their, to their to their obligations on the map. And the last one worth mentioning is arbitration. Now arbitration was picked up in the multilateral uh, by 26 countries. And this, this is in, contained in Article 19. And countries were given two options, something we call last best offer or baseball arbitration, where you have to, the two countries go to the arbitrator and say, I think the number should be X. And the other country says, I think it should be Y. And the only thing the arbitrator can do is pick between X and Y. And the theory is it will drive the negotiation to a more reasonable number by the parties, and that the arbitrator simply picks a number, writes no opinion, and his choice has no precedential value. 18 of the 25, more or less, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I have the exact right number, but it's around 18 picked the baseball, the US style. The remainders picked what they call independent opinion. There were people that wanted to bring issues to the arbitrator, but the arbitrator should be writing an opinion about that issue and how the arbitrator resolved it. That opinion does not have binding effect, I'm sorry, does not have presidential effect, but obviously binds the parties, and in all these cases, the taxpayer can, can walk away uh, and reject it. What I think is kind of interesting about the uh, arbitration provision is um, fully half of those countries who signed up for arbitration chose to exclude provisions that relate to a domestic general anti-avoidance rule. And so what, I'll return to this theme of ways countries can protect against treaty avoidance. Um, and sometimes they can use their domestic GARs. But when they want to use that tool, countries are very cautious about letting an arbitrator think about whether the GAR was A, used properly, or otherwise contravened uh, the meaning of the treaty. So now we get to treaty abuse. And the two, the two requirements were first, countries have to put in their preamble that not only are treaties about avoiding double, not, uh, double taxation, but treaties are also about um, creating opportunities for the avoidance or evasion of tax, what is sometimes called double non-taxation. So for the first time, that concept is embedded in the OECD treaty in a way that will be broadly accepted around the world. Now, 57 countries, uh, uh, then there were three choices countries were given. They could take the US LOB, beloved around the world for its elegant simplicity. They could take a simplified LOB, but if they did that, they had to take this principal purpose test with it, which I'll talk about. Or they could just take the principal purpose test. And now that all the ink has dried on the country's choices, 57 countries said, let's just go with the principal purpose test. Another 12 took LOB plus PPT. And I have to say, in those cases, the principal purpose test still can trump the, the simplified LOB. So we now have about 70 countries around the world. And it's going to be in over 1,100 treaties where the bilateral agreement is now built around this principal purpose test. And I'm going to read it twice tonight just because it kind of, it'll help you get sink into the words so you can understand it perhaps better than I do. Um, 
The principal purpose test says, notwithstanding any provisions of a covered tax agreement, a benefit under the covered tax agreement, that's what the, uh, that's what the old bilateral agreements are called once modified by the MLA. So it says, a benefit under the covered tax agreement shall not be granted in respect of an item of income or capital if it's reasonable to conclude, having regard to all relevant facts and circumstances, that obtaining that benefit was one of the principal purposes of any arrangement or transaction that resulted directly or indirectly in that benefit, unless it is established that granting that benefit in these circumstances would be in accordance with the object and purpose of the relevant provisions of the covered tax agreement. Now, I wanted to talk about the multilateral instrument tonight mostly because I was always concerned that the principal purpose test amounted to sort of politically correct mush that might not accomplish much and indeed could do harm to investment and real economic welfare in light of the varying abilities of tax administrations around the world and the uncertainty it'll create. And when this was being debated at the Committee on Fiscal Affairs at the OECD, where I represented the United States, I posed a hypothetical to the room of 100, no, it couldn't have been 100, it must have been 40 delegates, OECD plus G20 at the time. I said, now imagine a company wants to set up a financing arm in, inside its multinational. And the idea comes from the finance department. And the guys in the finance department say, finance sub, I have, that Cayman Islands, what, you know, that, we should go to the Cayman Islands. And as the idea is moving up in the company, like the tax people finally get a hold of the idea, and they say, that's a ridiculous idea. Because the Cayman Islands has no tax treaties, and every dollar of interest that goes into the Cayman Islands is going to be subject to withholding tax. I said, we can't put this finance sub in the Cayman Islands. How, we, we should put it in Luxembourg. So I turned to the group of delegates, um, 50 or whatever they were, and I said, did that transaction have as a principal purpose obtaining the benefits of the Luxembourg Treaty? in a way that's not consistent with the context and purpose of the treaty. Well, you know, my comments often at the OECD landed with a thud and were generally ignored. But after a few awkward moments, somebody said, well, no, that's not the kind of thing we have in mind. We think we, that would be covered by the PPT. And I said, well, don't we have an obligation as policymakers and administrators to kind of explain in our rules what it is we do mean so that people can uh, kind of understand the rules and kind of live by them. Now, one of the things you learn at the OECD is I was speaking to this group of folks who was the people who were being handed this shiny new blunt instrument of the PPT. And there was very little appetite to walk away from that kind of a rule in that particular setting. Well, tonight, rather than just this kind of casual skepticism I spoke about at the PPT, or sometimes I think about it as a, as a rant. Um, I thought I would try to take a deeper look at how did we get where we got with the PPT through the OECD process. So I started back to the 2015 was when the first report came out on, on uh, action item six on treaty abuse. And I have to say, I was really stunned to see that virtually everything I'm going to talk about tonight was dealt with in that report in two sentences. The two sentences were, a review of the treaty practices of OECD and non-OECD countries shows that countries use different approaches to try to address treaty shopping cases not already dealt with in their treaties, because sometimes there's specific rules. Based on the advantages and limitations of these approaches, which are never discussed anywhere in the OECD's work, it is recommended that the three-pronged approach be used to address treaty shopping situations, the three-pronged approach I just described, LOB, LOB uh, plus, uh, simplified LOB plus PPT or PPT. It is startling to me in retrospect that in light of the fact that the treaty abuse issue had been a topic that had preoccupied the OECD since at least the introduction of the beneficial owner concepts in 1997, and scholars and tax administrators for longer than that, that the potential options to combat tax abuse in treaties was reduced to three options without a mention of other paths that might have been taken or their relative merits. Now, while I'm critical of the use of the PPT in a multilateral instrument, it's true that the G20 OECD participants in the BEPS process were independent actors 
they indeed reached a consensus to go down the chosen path that we're now all going to live with. But that does not mean that either the process or the results that it reached are immune from criticism. As to process, my own view is that the process was secretariat-driven more than it was member-driven, and that to the extent it was member-driven, it was driven by the European members who dominate the OECD and who dominated the BEPS process and who faced extraordinary pressure to have deliverables for their ministers in what is for them a very challenging political environment around multinational tax avoidance. In addition to the political pressure was the self-inflected two-year deadline, which added extraordinary time pressure that might understandably have affected the quality of the work. As for the U.S., since we have and like our LOB, we were hardly key players in the broader debate of what countries might do in the absence of an LOB. Perhaps we should have made a greater effort to be effective in that debate as these rules will now seep into all aspects of cross-border activity. In any event, that's where we are. Um, but I think it's valuable to step back and ask whether it, is, whether it is a step forward or not in the space of international tax relations. So what follows is kind of a first draft of an assessment. Smarter, more knowledgeable folks than I will continue, many in this room, will continue to study and analyze these provisions. And in any event, the wisdom of the approach will only be known with the test of time when we can see what the results of this approach has been. But at the outset, put me down as deeply skeptical that PPT is a step forward. Now, lots of folks have thought a lot about treaty abuse and treaty shopping over the years. Um, so I decided to go dig deeper into some of those authorities, and I'm not going to cite them all here, but I found David wrote an article in 1983 in Law and Policy and International Business uh, called Tax Treaty Abuse, Policies and Issues. There was a 2002 OECD report that Mary Bennett pointed me to on restricting entitlements to treaty benefits. Professor Steph Van Weigel has a whole book called The Improper Use of Tax Treaties, and there's quite a list that goes on and on. Uh, in fact, most recently, J. Ross McDonald of, of, of Baker has a piece in Tax Lawyer entitled uh, Examining the U.S. Treaty Policy and Its History uh, in Treaty Shopping. And of course, the OECD commentary is always rich with observations and analysis. And I hope to do a, a, a further biography, a bibliography when I, when I get to push, put this out in public. Look, my goal today is not to summarize or synthesize all this great work, or even to add my unique observations about what is treaty abuse, what's not treaty abuse, and under what circumstances. But rather, it's to hold up the principal purpose test to the light for scrutiny, using a lot of that scholarship and thinking as a backdrop. And I really only want to ask a pretty simple question. Given all the competing interests, the difficult questions that these scholars have posed and grappled with. In light of the various tools that countries had available to them to combat treaty abuse, was the PPT the right choice? And was it the right choice to embed it in a multilateral instrument that will now use the same language in what I understand to be over a thousand treaties that will contain the language? Perhaps different from these scholars and perhaps influenced by my experience as a practitioner, I also intend to consider whether rules like the PPT need to be made taking into account the ability of tax administrations around the world to administer these rules in, in, in fairness and with integrity that our legal system should, should deserve, and whether certainty for taxpayers might have been a criteria in thinking through as tax policymakers the benefits of an approach such as, uh, such as the uh, PPT. Admittedly, issues of tax administration and uh, certainty, they don't really go to the legalness. And, and as, as you get into treaty writing, you, 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 a lot of it is this kind of legal, which we're all lawyers, so it makes sense, right? But it's this legal parsing of the standard in very theoretical ways. But what I think is that the policymaker needs to bring a little bit of a practical element to it and ask, can the rule be administered? And oh, by the way, what happens if nobody can figure out what the rule really is? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I will report, I never heard any of these last two points discussed while these rules were being developed at the OECD. So anyway, I kind of thought about myself like a guy in a virtual workshop. I'm going to think about, well, what are the tools that were available? How does this tool stack up to what they had available? What might we have thought about? And, um, and, and how should we kind of re-enter the debate of what, is, what are the right tools to use in connection with treaty abuse? 
And I'm going to start in a very simple way, because one of, the, one of my very first international tax law assignments came to me as a summer associate at Covington and Burling in 1983, where I was asked to write about a case called Aiken Industries, which may be famous to, well, it's famous to us international guys. But, um, uh, and what I like about Aiken Industries as a place to start is, is it helps us start thinking about, well, what are the tools available to tax policymakers to think about treaty abuse? Because it's actually a simple case, and it's pretty easy for me to just explain it in a few sentences. So a US company borrowed money from its Bahamian affiliate, uh, a lot of money. And somebody must have woken up at some point and said, you know, when we have to go pay the interest back to the Bahamian affiliate, there's a 30% withholding tax in the United States. Uh, what are we going to do? So another great person in the tax group or outside counsel um, came and said, well, here's an idea. Why don't, why don't we have the Bahamian company assign the notes to a Honduran company, because Honduras has a treaty with the United States. And under the Honduran treaty, it's only required that the interest be received by a Honduran corporation. So now, US pays the interest to Honduras, gets the treaty, Honduras had set up separate loans that mirrored the first loans with the uh, Bahamian entity, pays on the money, voila, tax planning, 101. Well, the court said, you know, we don't think under the US uh, treaty, uh, US-Honduras treaty, that it's right to view the Honduran entity as having received the interest. And we don't think it's right to have treated as having received the interest in light of that back-to-back -back arrangement we learned about while studying the case. And so the court effectively said, because Honduras was not the beneficial owner of the interest income the U.S.-Honduran treaty did not apply. <clears throat> the place is great to begin making some observations about history of combating treaty abuse. First, because a treaty is an agreement between two sovereigns, the issue of abuse arises in a fundamentally different context than arrangements that are solely within the purview of a domestic tax authority. Indeed, the Aiken court, it surprised me actually that they did acknowledge that, because I think they ignored it, but they said it, they said, while noting that the term received was not defined in the treaty, and therefore, as international folks, we know that the very terms of the treaty could be defined under local law, US law, of the country applying the treaty, the court acknowledged nonetheless that, quote, in deciding whether a given taxpayer in a specific instance is protected by the terms of a treaty, we must, quote, give the specific words of a treaty a meaning consistent with the genuine shared expectations of the contracting parties. And in so doing, it's necessary to examine not only the language, but the entire context of the agreement, quoting Maximoff v. United States. And while it appears to me the court appears, gave only lip service to these shared expectations, because I don't really remember the Hondurans piping up and saying what they meant by received, the court at least acknowledged this particular characteristic of cases involving treaties that their bilateral nature makes the act of interpretation different from interpreting law in a purely domestic context. But the point I want to use Aiken for to start with tonight is, it illustrates the very first important tool available to countries seeking to deal with treaty abuse, domestic law. Both OECD and UN commentary note that tax authorities seeking to address the improper use of a tax treaty may first consider the application of specific anti-abuse rules included in domestic tax law. And the UN and the OECD have given a lot of examples. They talk to things like CFC rules, thin cap rules. Um, they talk about uh, special rules for financial investments, so kind of akin to our CFC rules, for condu uh, special rules for conduit companies, foreign investment fund rules that prevent the deferral and avoidance of tax on investment income. And so we put down a marker and the US, of course, has promulgated specific anti-conduit rules in its regs, other rules under Section 894 that limit treaty event, uh, benefits in, in the case of pass-through entities under certain circumstances. And Aiken Industries itself is an example of a country interpreting the terms of the treaty in accordance with its rights under Article 3.2 of the model to give terms the meeting they have under local law, quote, unless the context requires otherwise. To be sure, as the OECD commentary notes, if the application of a domestic law provision and a treaty produce conflicting results, uh, 
The treaty must prevail. Of course, some countries have also included in their domestic law a legislative anti-abuse rule of general application or a GAR. And these too can operate to avoid treaty abuse. While the compatibility of these rules as applied in certain cases raises interesting and important questions concerning their consistency with treaty obligations. And I have to confess, if you want to write a paper on this, it's the heart of darkness. Um, but it, it's out there, and there does seem to be a general acceptance that the application of GARs can be compatible with treaty provisions. And in any event, countries jealously guard their prerogatives to apply the rules in cross-border settings when treaties are implicated. And I'll make two observations. The MAP work coming out of MLI says you can bring to MAP a dispute over whether a domestic anti-avoidance rule violates the treaty. But countries didn't like that. So the, so the guidance also says, but countries are not committed to have to resolve that dispute. Um, that's compromise. That's how the sausage is made. And in the arbitration space, as I already mentioned, fully half of the countries that signed up for mandatory arbitration, 13 countries said, but you can, we will not arbitrate whether the application of our domestic GAR violates the terms of the treaty with respect to which arbitration is sought. But the point stands that among the first two tools are domestic anti-abuse rules, whether they're specific, whether they're more general in a GAR, and before I move away from that, the OECD commentary also points out that in some countries, like the United States, judicial doctrines, such as substance over form that are part of domestic law, might appropriately be carried into the treaty context. And finally, the OECD commentary itself says some states view abuses as an abuse of the convention itself, as the commentary notes that under this view, they can ignore abusive transactions, such as those entered into with the view of obtaining un unintended benefits, because the commentary notes that, quote, this interpretation results from the object and purpose of tax conventions, as well as the obligation to interpret them in good faith. Well, if countries already have the authority under the Vienna Convention to decline to give benefits when the benefit is opposed to the object and purpose of the treaty, we, can be, we should at least step back and wonder why we needed to put the PPT clause into the contract, but I'll return to that. Aiken points us in the direction of another tool available to countries for dealing with treaty abuse, specifically targeted tax treaty provisions. Because not every legal system was flexible enough to do what our courts did in the Aiken case, in the 1977 OECD model, the words beneficial owner were added to the articles on dividends, interest, and royalties. In a sense, what they were doing was codifying in the treaty what Aiken did by US common law application of, of our treaty or interpretation of our treaty. And so another tool that we had available to us that is used and is still existing in treaties are specific treaty anti-abuse anti rules that target different uh, areas. And so that becomes another, another list. And indeed, until the most recent revision of the OECD model, which is just this July of 2017, uh, the draft that was circulated, the OECD model, until the PPT test and the, the, tr the trio I talked about, included neither a PPT nor an LOB provision as part of the model. Rather, it described various options that countries might want to consider in their bilateral treaties, and in doing so, invited countries, as you're thinking about it in your bilateral negotiations, to take into account, among other things, the legal context in both contracting states. And in particular, the extent to which domestic law already provides an appropriate response to the avoidance strategy being talked about. The commentary went on to describe specific provisions that might combat conduit company cases, uh, that, might co that might contain subject to tax rules. You only get the benefit of a treaty rule if, if on the other side the income is subject to tax. In, in the treaty country. Certain rules that were akin to our base erosion rules in our LOB, in other words, yeah, you might have the right owners in that country, but all the income's getting siphoned off to, to countries that are not the right uh, the residents of the treaty partner. So there they were laid out in the OECD, and the OECD said, oh, by the way, if you're gonna have some specific anti-abuse rules, 
you really ought to also think about carve-outs so that you don't apply the anti-abuse rules in situations that are not appropriate. And it uses things like a good business purpose, uh, real economic activity, uh, et cetera, that are listed in the commentary so that it was very cautious and careful that going down the anti-abuse rule route needed at least some backstops to be sure that there could be at least some cabining you know, of those concepts. Now, I, will, I do want to take a minute on the USLOB because it is, in fact, another approach available to policymakers. Um, it was among the choices countries could adopt in the MLI if they had accompanied it, by the way, with domestic anti-conduit rules like we have in our, uh, whatever they are, ADD 3, 1, regs. No one adopted the USLOB. I think there are a few observations about the USLOB are warranted. First, when considering tools to combat treaty avoidance on the spectrum of objective versus subjective rules, the LOB is to be sure way over on the objective side of the continuum, which one would assume helps with issues of certainty and arguably administrability. Um, at least for my practice, the US LOB permits investors in the vast majority of cases, whether you like the response or not, to know whether they'll be able to obtain the benefits of the treaty by applying the objective rules set out. I think that's a virtue that the PPT doesn't possess. Second, and I have intentionally avoided the topic of the purpose of tax treaties because it's a morass out of which I would never emerge, the USLOB is firmly rooted in notions that the purpose of tax treaties is to avoid double taxation and prevent avoidance and not rooted in a purpose of promoting investment as a sort of standalone purpose to enter a tax treaty. And at least that, if you go back through the USLOB with that prism in mind, and I think if you add to it some notions of our 894 regs and the preamble to it that talk about the subject to tax concept that under certain circumstances, we're going to care that the income that's being relieved in the US is taxed elsewhere, you can kind of reverse engineer the purposes that the US, I'm sorry, that the way the US thinks of the purpose of treaties and that, that is then embodied in the LOB. But the LOB has many detractors, not only, of course, abroad, but in the United States as well. On the pure substance of the LOB, Ross McDonald, I mentioned his article earlier, echoed sentiments that I heard often at the OECD, that it is horribly over-inclusive and horribly under-inclusive. In other words, it's kind of not a tool that does what it was intended to do. And I also want to report that I think that theme was repeated over and over again at the OECD, so but the LOB for a lot of reasons, but particularly this one, I think, became damaged goods. Beyond that, McDonald in his article questioned just how much the US LOB really provides bright line tests. He explained, precise rules are a chimera. Drilling down into so-called precise rules ultimately leads back to issues of ambiguity and subjectivity that the, price, the precise rules were intended to avoid. Finally, their complexity alone has been the subject to criticism even here in the US. No lesser a person than David Tillinghast himself observed referring to the treaty shopping provisions of the 1993 U.S. Netherlands Treaty. The United States has indulged its pension for writing complicated prescriptive rules without regard to whether they are enforceable. The next sentence is kind of a nice one. This serves only to penalize the conscientious and reward the unscrupulous. I'd also note that these um, complicated rules that David referred to have only gotten admittedly more complicated as the LOB has shifted and grown over the years since David wrote that in 1996. But in a world in which policymakers must choose between competing approaches to combating treaty abuse, it is still fair to ask whether, notwithstanding the shortcomings of the US LOB, we have landed in a better place with the PPT embedded in a multilateral instrument. So with these choices before them, OECD members approved as an option the inclusion of a PPT test in a multilateral instrument, and once the instrument was open for signature, they overwhelmingly chose this option. Why? Well, first, as the BEPS process played out, countries were given essentially two options. Take the LOB or the PPT. Any discussion, as the discussion above seeks to illustrate, we did not have to be in this position, as there are, in fact, a variety of tools available to combat treaty abuse, 
some of which would not have been, had the limitations of the PPT that I'll talk about. Once the choice was narrowed as it was, even for those who may have viewed this as a tough choice, I think a sort of widespread acceptance of the view that the LOB was under and over inclusive, sealed the deal, and folks went to the PPT. And second, and this was my experience throughout BEPS, if you tell a tax authority that they can either have a complicated technical rule or a blunt instrument that leaves them with all the power to determine on a case-by-case -case, case, case -case basis whether something bad has occurred, it seemed to me at least that they would choose the blunt instrument every time. I would add that it was certainly expressed to me various times at the OECD that vague subjective rules are better than clear ones because multinationals will simply plan around the clear rules. So what to make of this chosen path? First, you might ask why a minimum standard was needed at all, since all of the above tools that I mentioned are available to countries, ranging from these domestic anti-abuse rules, judicial doctrines, specific rules put in their treaties, et cetera. It's a really good question why we needed this. The 2000, there was a 2009 UN report from its committee on experts that observed that, quote, developing countries may also be hesitant to adopt or apply general anti-abuse rules if they believe these rules would introduce an unacceptable level of uncertainty that would hinder foreign investment in their territory. Notwithstanding this concern, I was told during BEPS that when two countries with unequal bargaining power enter into treaty negotiations, some countries are unable to successfully come to agreement on including anti-abuse provisions in their treaty and that a minimum standard would help those with unequal bargaining power protect their tax base. And that's a fair point if supported by experience, and I have no reason to believe it's not. But this, in turn, relates to an entirely separate topic, another good paper topic for the class members, of why countries enter into treaties in the first place and whether it makes economic sense for them to do so, particularly if their treaty can become a treaty with the world if they don't protect their base in the process. But that's a question for another day. I'd also note, however, something I learned along the way, and it goes to the desire of countries to induce foreign direct investment. What kind of struck me, and I was a little late to learning this in the BEPS process, there's absolutely nothing in the minimum standard that requires a country to protect its base by actually enforcing the minimum standard. They're forced to have it, but they're not necessarily forced to enforce it with respect to their own tax base. It is rather only, um, just as, for example, earning stripping rules are, are, are mentioned in BEPS as a potential tool, but they're not a minimum standard that any country has to note. But the minimum standard approach misses the point that requiring the inclusion of a provision in all treaties offers no insight into whether any particular country has an incentive to enforce it, since tax competition pressures among countries remain and are an ever-present reality for all countries, especially developing countries. In any event, even if there is a consensus that countries should be able to force other countries to include anti-treaty abuse language in treaties, there remains a separate question whether the PPT represents a step forward. Now, I read the language earlier. I'm not going to reread it again because I'm looking at the clock. But with an audience such as this, I don't really want to spend time parsing the language of the PPT. Uh, I think that we should all agree that as we sit here today, it is not clear at all what conduct will run afoul of the provision, and I would like to make a few observations. First, let's go back to Aiken Industries and its progeny. Remember I said that they put this beneficial ownership test in the, in the treaty back in 1977, and countries said this is great because, you know, it wasn't clear in a lot of jurisdictions um, what, what, how that was going to be uh, treated. Well, it's worth mentioning that that new language in the treaties didn't turn out to be a magic bullet, as a lot of the folks around here who study this know better than I do. And why? And I think this is so critically important to this whole analysis. Different countries have different modes of interpretation of language, whether it's in treaties, statutes, constitutions, or even contracts. We all in this room appreciate, for example, that those of us in common law tradition countries have a conceptually easier time distinguishing beneficial owners from bare legal title owners than folks raised in civil law countries. And even within the bounds of common law and civil law countries, there are variations in kind of the elasticity that can be given to words and concepts and purposes 
in interpreting various uh, legal documents. So, as you know, in the United States, a generation of practitioners have grappled with conduit fact patterns harder than Aiken, because they all are harder than Aiken, um, without really coming to some precise conclusion on, on what it means to be a beneficial owner. And indeed, the United States put out regulations that deal specifically with other aspects. But as the authors of a 2011 article coming out of IFA pointed out, that the courts in several jurisdictions, Canada, Indonesia, the Netherlands, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, have been asked to interpret the new beneficial ownership phrase in treaties, and they really haven't had much of an easy time interpreting a, a relatively simple concept in a relatively narrow rule. And so the question arises um, in light of the debate has, I'm sorry, the debate on beneficial ownership has moved so far as to include a suggestion by Philip Baker, the UK uh, barrister, that certain terms should be treated as having, quote, an international fiscal meeting as opposed to a purely local law meeting. So as I stand back from the concepts I've examined so far, I'm left to consider that even specific anti-abuse rules and treaties covering relatively narrow concepts uh, have given taxpayers and tax administrations difficulty. And part of that difficulty results in part, at least, from differing legal traditions in countries trying to parse similar language. Now, you might say to me, taxpayers always have to deal with differing legal systems and different interpretations of similar concepts. So you might say, well, that's just a feature. That's not really a bug. That just describes the world as it is. But I still think it's fair, in light of that observation, to ask whether, um, whether the people that were endorsing the PPT test um, in light of the various interpretations it would encounter around the world, had any sense of what fact patterns it might in fact be applied to, or what principles will guide it. Most of us in this room, there's examples, if you go through the commentary, there's, there's A, B, C, D, J, K, L, M, whatever M is, J, K, L, M, 13 examples uh, in, in the commentary. And, um, and, and if you try to reverse engineer them like you might do as a good lawyer, you, you would want to see if you could get some interpretations that lead to broadly consistent uh, interpretations of the principles. And I don't have any time. I'm not going to do that exercise, although you may want to try it at home in your spare time. It's challenging to read the examples and discern the principles that are going to motivate the PPT. The only principle I can discern, and as you will see, it's not really a principle, is what I call the tax abuse porn test. For the non-US folks in the audience, the reference is from a line used by the late Potter Stewart, a Supreme Court Justice of the United States, who once suggested that although he could not define pornography, he explained, I know it when I see it. <laughs> so there's one example in the commentary, I think, that gives us a principle. And it involves a usufruct. And my one takeaway from the PPT examples is, if your tax arrangement includes the syllable fruct, you are, how shall I say it, not going to get the benefit of that particular treaty. <laughs> Beyond that, I have not been able to discern broader principles from the examples that might aid taxpayers and administrators to apply the test with any consistency or integrity. Indeed, had the drafters been able to discern any such principles, one would have expected that they might have explained them. They did not. As if the linguistic and legal uncertainty looking at the plain language is not enough, I should add that there's new preamble language now in the MLI. And there are two concepts in the new preamble. Remember, the preamble under the Inventor Convention can inform the interpretation of a treaty. And there are two new concepts baked in. There's the concept of double non-taxation. And again, the paper to be written on what that means. Um, and there's another concept that profits should be taxed where value is created. Um, and no one knows what that means. And so now we are adding on to the interpretive mess of the words. So it's difficult to see how the new language in the PPT, coupled with new preamble references um, and, about non-taxation and value creation, will not make the interpretive issues surrounding beneficial ownership seem simple in comparison to the interpretive issues we're going to face in interpreting the PPT. In the Dubrow article published just in 2011, after the IFA conference uh, where there was a general report on the topic, he wrote, relatively few tax treaties contain GARs according to which treaty benefits are denied if, for example, the main purpose of the transaction is to obtain such benefits. 
That alone is an interesting data point when nearly 70 countries are now about to add such an untested provision to what I understand is about 1,000 bilateral treaties. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip, but David had written back in his 83 article about the fact that since the 50s, certain US treaties used questions about whether arrangements were created or maintained in order to get the lower dividend rate under, in that day, the US-UK treaty and other treaties. And back in 83, David explained that these were subjective tests and troublesome as no administrators would really understand how to apply those tests. And that will uh, uh, remain the same today. And indeed, when we were, when we were, nego when we were talking at the CFA about the PPT, my UK colleague mentioned at one point that the UK had a PPT in its treaty for the longest time, and that there'd never been a case. And I have to confess, he kind of shut me up because I didn't quite know what to make of the data point. I was reminded of the story of the guy in New York walking down the street with a, a stick out in front of him. And another guy comes up to me and says, what's that for? He says, it's to keep elephants away. And the guy says, there's no elephants here. And he says, see, it works. And that seemed to be part of the logic uh, of adopting uh, the TP. OK, I'm getting to the end. Um, in a touch to me that seems almost ironic, I wasn't sure if something could be almost ironic, um, or maybe even comical, once the BEPS reports were finalized in 2015, the European Commission took note of the PPT and was generally on board, except it was concerned that tax authorities running around willy-nilly applying a principal purpose test, that's my language, not theirs, um, might run afoul of, quote, agreed standards across the union to provide legal certainty both for taxpayers as well as tax administrations. Really. More importantly, they noted that the PPT needed to be aligned with the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union as regards abuse of law. And this commission recommendation dated January 1st, 2016, then recommended that when member states include a PPT in their treaties, they insert a phrase so that it reads, a benefit will not be granted. Remember, the original language was, if, it's a, if it has a bad purpose, blah, 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 unless it's established that granting the benefit would be in accordance with the object and purpose. Well, the commission recommends you add the phrase, unless it established that it reflect a genuine economic activity or that granting the benefit would be in accordance with the object and purpose. Now, what's kind of fascinating, that language is not in the MLI. That language is impliedly required by the European Court of Justice under the freedom of establishment rules of the EU, which I had learned to my extraordinary pain while I was in government, which rules are superior to the rules of the treaties that the countries adopt. And so right out of the gate, we have one of the first groupings of jurisdictions that were in effect pushing all this, really having no idea what it means or what added words and concepts the Europeans alone are going to have to bring to the table. And second, whether those rules will be different in an intra-European set of treaties or a European treaty with a non-European jurisdiction <coughs> under different circumstances. Again, I don't have time to talk about it, but there was an ECJ case on September 7th called EQIOM, e which is very entertaining in this space on the European interpretation. It's a different setting. It's the it's the European Parent Subsidiary Directive on Dividends and Interest, but they use the exact same language and concepts that the MLI uses. Apart from all the interpretive uh, issues, I'm greatly concerned about the now nearly universal PPT being interpreted by tax administrations around the world whose decisions are not always firmly anchored in the rule of law. Indeed, David noted in his 1983 article, not every revenue authority is the IRS. And think what you might about the IRS, it remains true that not every revenue authority is the IRS. Tax administrations around the world give revenue agents targets. They give targets to finance ministries, financial targets. They continue to evaluate and remunerate agents on grounds that are not consistent with an objective and dispassionate assessment of the facts in the law. They provide access to appeals rights that are at best uneven and have suspect, or at a minimum, painfully slow judicial processes. In some countries, the tax police show up, and a taxpayer has to deal with both a civil and a criminal proceeding on what, in most countries, would have been a, a, a typical tax audit. Now, what I say about these tax authorities, I mean in a descriptive way and not a judgmental way. 
I don't in any way mean to underestimate the challenges of tax administrations around the world, particularly in developing countries that operate in trying conditions, often with inadequate resources. I am simply saying that the choice of the anti-abuse tool chosen to be included across the entire network of international tax treaties might have been at least partially informed by the ability of tax administrators to administer it. David Tillinghad made this point about our LOB back in his 86 article, and, and indeed the OECD commentary makes a suggestion to countries, but not a requirement, that like some countries have different review panels, or the application of GAR needs to be referred up in the finance ministry or their IRS before it's applied, countries might consider doing similarly with the new PPT. Not a requirement, it will remain to, to be seen. Finally, I'd observe that at the time the PPT will be inserted into hundreds of treaties, the G20 and the OECD, with the support of the presidencies of China and Germany, have undertaken to remind tax authorities of the benefits to investment, of certainty in tax practice. For example, the G20 finance communique uh, in China in July of 26, 2016 emphasized, quote, the benefits of tax certainty to promote investment in trade. Indeed, during the German presidency of the G20 in March of this year, the IMF OECD issued a report to the finance ministers on this very topic of the connection of tax certainty to investment and global growth. It's hard to square the inclusion of a vague new test in hundreds of treaties as consistent with the goals of promoting tax certainty. Are there arguments for the PPT? Yes, and I'll say three quickly. There are three arguments that come to mind. I'm not sure any of them support it. The first is that country, since countries have a great deal of latitude to use domestic guards that I've already said, then maybe you're no worse off because you are already in countries that might be using subjective rules and bad administrations to enforce their tax rules against you. So the guard doesn't make you any worse off. I would simply contend that is not necessarily a positive reason to include the PPT, although I think the point is well taken. The second point I think has some validity is that it is true that in some countries, um, they won't enforce domestic laws uh, that seem not squarely anchored in the language of the treaty. So they needed treaty language to give the courts something to use when the tax administrations themselves were trying to combat treaty abuse. Again, I think it's another fair point, but I don't think it answers the question that the PPT had to be the minimum standard that was put in tax treaties to do that. So I think you can see that my view is whatever the benefits of those advancing the PPT hope to achieve, I think it'll be outweighed by the costs associated with administering a vague rule that now creates uncertainty for taxpayers, investors, and administrators the world over. But people will have the chance to observe it in practice, and I encourage the academics to consider ways to track the real-world implementation uh, of the test and its relative costs. So where do we go from here? Is this speech just crying over spilt milk since the provision has now been chosen to be included all around the world? I hope not. So I, I'll say three things. I think the international community needs to move on several fronts. Now that there's a new tool for countries to, should, I'm sorry, now that there is a new tool, countries should consider proactive ways to bring some certainty for investment in their jurisdictions, whether that be through rulings, general pronouncers, pronouncements as to factors countries will take into account in applying the tests or whatever. Second, I think organizations like the IMF, OECD, and the Forum on Tax Administration need to focus on strengthening tax administrations around the world based on the rule of law and seek some convergence around best practices. This is very challenging, not the most headline-grabbing project for the OECD, but it's actually very important. And finally, I think the OECD should continue to develop commentary to help countries apply the new standard. Plainly, what's been done to date is not enough. I want to close by addressing specifically the NYU students that are here this evening. One of the things I love about coming up to speak to David's class over the years and meeting the range of students here at NYU is that I'm fully cognizant of the fact that just as I was honored to work at the United States Treasury Department for nearly four years, you too will serve your governments and international organizations in leadership roles as you proceed uh, down through your careers. What I wanted to demonstrate tonight is that formulating good tax policy is hard. When it's your turn to lead, take the hard issues head on, do the analysis, think through the issues, and find solutions that come closest to doing 
the most good with the least harm. Resist the easy crowd pleasers because they will often be floored. But keep in mind that at the end of the day, the job of policymakers is to find solutions that advance the rule of law, foster growth and prosperity. Because that is a way to truly improve people's lives. And when all is said and done, that is what the task of those in government should be about. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Bob. That was, that was fascinating. I have all sorts of reactions, but we, I don't have time to share them with you. Uh, but I would like to ask the audience if anyone has any questions they want to put to Bob, because I, I promised we'd take a couple of questions. And we, uh, even though we're exceeding our time, we will take one or two if anybody wants to get up and ask any. So now's your chance. I'm not going to leave this open for very long, however. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, so people like Jacques Sassfield, I've talked about with this, who's another well-known treaty guy, people say, well, you, it wasn't that good before, it was uncertain. Actually, my experience was when you have now a new concept in hundreds of treaties, we're going to see increased enforcement just by the nature of the fact that this, this instrument has been put out there, the auditors, everybody has it. So even if we had a certain degree of this in the past, which we have, I think this exacerbates it because it's now on everybody's mind in every audit, in every case a treaty applies. And so I, I think in that sense, it, it is indeed a step back. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, we'll take one more question if there is one. There doesn't seem to be. I'm gonna make one observation just because, just to finish this up, which is I, I was sitting listening to Bob and, and one of the things that occurred to me is, first of all, he was absolutely heroic in representing the United States in all of these discussions in the OECD. But I have the distinct sense as someone who's been in this game for almost 50 years now and, and came to it at a time when uh, U.S. leadership in the international tax area was uh, almost unquestioned. And it does, I have the distinct sense that that leadership has seeped away and that we are essentially in the United States in the role of observers while the rest of the world is, is carrying forward in all sorts of ways that are, are going to affect the United States profoundly, but in which, uh, but for Bob and his colleagues, uh, we, we have not played much of a role. I, I just make that observation. It, it, I do have the distinct feeling, of course, this isn't the only area this is true in, but I do have the distinct feeling of, a, uh, of an erosion of U.S. influence in this area that is, it is absolutely palpable. So I thank you all for your attention. We have a little bit of a reception here at the I thank Bob again for a wonderful talk, which is very stimulating, and we'll have uh, we'll have chance to exchange views on that later in the evening. So thank you. <laughs>